would like to welcome everyone to the April 1st meeting of the Town of Franklin Board of Alton. I'd like to welcome the new town manager, Warren K. with us tonight in that seat. Uh, we'll start down the agenda. We had meetings of February 28th and, and March 4th. Minutes are in your agenda packages. So, uh, I'll wait to hear from the board. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, take care of the public session first to give a little bit of more time. Dan, you signed up. Dan, you signed up public session. <coughs> Um, it took 15 tries, but I'll try again. Maybe, perhaps, we can get Dogwood Drive cleaned up. Maybe the guys aren't too busy holding shovels up or anything. They can come out. They come out there last time. They must <laughs> spent 10 or 15 minutes. And that was about it. Maybe they can get the wood shepherd to come out there and maybe spend a half hour or so. Maybe really clean the place up. But this is a real wreck out there. Yeah, you gotta go out there to see what it's like. I used to clean it up myself and always kept it real nice, you know, and I always I always went out there every day and cleaned everything up and I was able to do it, but now I can't do it anymore. Maybe the town can do it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of paying y'all to do it. It's part of your job and I don't know why I gotta pay to have something like that done. Not that big of a deal. You got people working for you. You think they do something now and then like that? Wouldn't really kill them, would it? Can I get in? Okay. I'll be here next month. All right. Nobody else signed up in the public session, but this isn't the public session on the rezoning. This is just general comments. Okay, now we'll move into a public hearing. For the rezoning petition for the section of uh, Pauline Drive, I'm going to ask Derek Rowland to just bring us up to speed, uh, give us an executive summary of the process and where we're at this point. Derek, come on up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Before we get started, I, I realize, and I was just looking at your agenda packets and the maps that, that are in your tablets are not in color. So, you know, I'll, I'll provide you with a map and color of this rezoning that, that we'll be discussing. And that is a homemade North Arrow on there, Farrell. So thank you, sir. So. just give you a brief summary of this rezoning. It encompasses the three parcels at the terminus of Pauline Avenue. The aforementioned parcels going from north to south on the western edge of that corridor there are 5.76, 5.12, and 2.59 acres respectively. And for a total of 13.47 acres on those three tracks. These, as you'll see, the, the, the corridor of Pauline Avenue there, with the exception of these three parcels at the end, both the eastern and western edges of that corridor, all the way up through there, have been zoned R2. These properties remain R1, and that is why the applicants are here tonight with this rezoning petition. To give you a little background on it, the planning board recommended approval of this rezoning, and it is based on the policy guidelines one through five that, that are contained in the UDO. And these, these are put in place to give our planning board 
something to look at when making a recommendation to you and a checklist. And I will hand you a copy and I'll also read a copy uh, aloud if you would like me to, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's just five of them, or if you want to read it, go ahead. Um, just to kind of give you an idea. But before I pass them out, it says the following policy guidelines shall be followed by the planning board concerning zoning amendments. Number one, the proposal will place all properties similarly situated in the area in the same category or in appropriate complementary categories. Number two, there is convincing demonstration that all uses permitted under the proposed district classification would be in the general public interest and not merely in the interest of an individual or small group. There is convincing demonstration that all uses permitted under the proposed district classification would be appropriate in the area included in the proposed change. Number four, there is convincing demonstration that the character of any neighborhood will not be materially and adversely affected by any use permitted in the proposed change. And number five, the proposed change is in accord with the principles of growth, sound planning principles, and any applicable small area plan. And again, I'll submit these uh, to you so you can have something to, to look at there. But that was the five principles as per our unified development ordinance that the planning board had taken into consideration when reviewing this <coughs> proposed rezone. Um, so with that being said, they reviewed that at their February 18th meeting. The public hearing was set for today by this board on Mar March 4th, and here we are today. What, what we have uh, had happen between then and now, a protest petition has been submitted to the planning department. It has been reviewed. It has been deemed sufficient. Now, what qualifies this protest petition as being valid is that 5% of the owners within a 100 foot wide buffer around the property being rezoned have stated in writing that they oppose the proposed amendment. And you have a map included with that buffer being shown and the names and signers of the protest petition. And what that does is when a protest petition is deemed valid and has been submitted, then that requires the board approve that rezoning amendment, not by a simple majority, but by a three-fourths vote or a super majority. Five out of six. Yes, sir. Okay. The current zoning designation is R1, and the request is to go to R2. And describe just briefly the significance. R1 in the UDO is residential, it's medium density residential. R2 is medium to high density residential, and it allows for multifamily dwellings, manufactured homes, and the like. You have in, within the R2, you can put up to eight dwelling units on an acre. So it's a little bit higher density than the R1. And the, of course, manufactured homes are permissible in the R2 district, whereas they wouldn't be in the R1 district, nor would your multifamily dwelling units. And the yellow on the map? The light yellow is R1, and the dark yellow is R2. The dark yellow here is all R2. Yes, sir. And then the orange is the same orange one. is a neighborhood mixed use. Oh, yeah. The in the tracks up for rezoning. The orange track. I'm not. I'm not sure what that. Is. And the, orange the orange is neighborhood mixed use. I mean, mixed use. What's in there? Where is that property? That that property right there is at the end of Pauline Avenue. Um, it's the mixed use. Mixed use. Mixed use. Not. I'm not sure about that. Maybe there's. 
Vanderwood? No, Vanderwood owns the big, uh, that, that might actually encompass some of Vanderwood's, but Vanderwood owns that big track right there that's between, that's to the south of the properties and the four lane there. That's probably back in behind the four street right in there somewhere. It's just yeah. the properties off the four street, the old sale barn, stuff right in there out for the bottom of that. Yeah. Yeah.
to R1 until the county changed the zone. It was R1 at one time, or in, similar to R1, where you could not have mobile homes uh, on the property. And uh, we were uh, just wondering when they changed the zoning, all the homes on Pauline Avenue are, are constructed homes. There, there are no much, uh, uh, there are no uh, mobile homes. And we were wondering why it was changed from an R, uh, basically an R1 rating to an R2 without any notification or input from homeowners. Why was the zoning made available in this area for mobile homes and mobile home parks when there were none on there? And by the way, in the R2, you can have a mobile home park. It's, uh, and I'm not saying that that's what you're going to put in, but that's the possibility. There should not be mobile homes added on Pauline Avenue area. If mobile homes are added, the land and home values will definitely drop. With the land in question under R2 zoning, this land that we're talking about, it would be permissible to have a mobile home park on the 10.8 acres, which is now undeveloped, of land, and be legal to have either 58 or 86 mobile homes. Now, the reason I say the two, I, I don't understand the, 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 the difference in the zoning of R2. Uh, to explain that real quickly, I'll say that you can have eight single family homes on per acre. Okay, we're talking 10.8 acres. That would be 86 mobile homes you could put on that property. Uh, but yet, the next paragraph down, it says every lot has to be at least 8,000 square feet. Well, if you divide 8,000 into an acre, that would put you only 56. So there's a, I don't know which one it would be, but even if it were 56 mobile homes on the property, uh, this, this would be a problem for, for homeowners around the area. It's, it's, right now, there are no, no mobile homes on the property, and we're going to end up having with the possibility of up to 56 mobile homes. With this possibility of a mobile home park, which I'm saying just the possibility of a mobile home park, we are back to the same problem of a huge increase in traffic on Pauline Avenue. And how would the town fix that problem? We got the end of that problem before on this same property. With mobile homes or mobile home parks, there is a greater possibility for crime and disturbances. And this would definitely diminish the value of the land and the uh, homeowners that are now presently on Pauline Avenue. Keeping this property R1 zoning would restrict overgrowth and would maintain a quality neighborhood. This seems to me to be far more uh, sensible solution. Why well, open the door to these possible problems? And being that uh, Pauline Avenue has all homes on it right now that are eight, that would pass an R1, I don't see why we couldn't change the whole area to an R1 if that would satisfy everybody. But we're just concerned about the possibility of having the area completely turned around by having a mobile home park or a, a number of, of homes or however, whatever <coughs> possibilities they have of doing on this property. Uh, I, I ask you to consider the possible consequences that might be created if you were to vote on the zoning change. And that's basically what I have to say. I think. Thank you, John. That exhausts my sign-up sheet, but we're willing to have other interested parties if you are an affected party, one who lives in the neighborhood and work, and have the right, so to speak, to complain. We'll certainly give you the time. 
or speak for it, either one. Yes. My name is Richard Brady. I own two properties on Pauline Avenue, 435 and 534 Pauline Avenue. Mailing address is PO Box 662 in Franklin. I'm here tonight to speak against the zoning change request. The first home I owned at 534 I bought about 18, 20 years ago. And the second home I got had about, give or take, three or four years now. And um, since the purchase of the property, there's been, at the very beginning of Old Coat Drive, close to the greenway there, there's been a single wide trailers brought in, moved off of Forest Avenue, put over there on Old Coat, and um, they're not maintained, don't look well. You drive by there and look at them, that look like we have any code or any ordinances whatsoever or an officer enforcing anything. Our concern here, uh, folks on Pauline Avenue, is the fact that um, we're concerned that if, if this land is changed, this, this zoning change goes through tonight, that, like uh, John said earlier, there's a number of possibilities how many mobile homes could be put in there. Um, concerned about, as far as our property values, we're concerned about if you have 58, 60, 80 mobile homes, they have two cars for each one. Look at the traffic on the road. It's, it's a very close road, narrow road, uh, where this subject property is. The road starts going in and getting smaller. And once you get past it and turn the curb and you officially run out of the town of the limits, um, the road becomes basically one, one lane road. Um, but our concern is the uh, the questions we have as well as the infrastructure, the traffic, the increase in traffic on the narrow road, the increase in commercial vehicles coming and going. Um, also, um, when we bought years ago, trailers weren't allowed in there. And for some unknown reason, we were not officially notified. And I understand research and regulations and everything. We don't have to receive a notification as far as an individual letter telling us about the UDO and et cetera that took place, but um, we, we also feel like that um, if, this, if this goes through, we weren't uh, properly informed of the change three or four years ago, as we were told when the zoning changed, and um, it's, it, we just don't think it's a good fit for us. We're concerned about, you know, uh, as far as infrastructure, as far as the water source, the water pressure for us being at the end of the road as well. Um, and uh, the value of our homes we're concerned about. And I'm sure each and every one of you would be concerned if you had if you land and you were surprised suddenly uh, in the newspaper or you got a letter in the mail saying you moved 13 acres in your neighborhood um, is suddenly up for a zoning change. And um, what are you going to do about it? After you work hard for many years and this is your home and, and uh, you, you know, suddenly it could possibly change the value of the change. I know that um, there, is, there is a big concern about it. Numerous things, as I state. And our biggest concern, too, is, is the traffic. And it's also the value of our homes. Um, I'm sure that some of you have property close by in your own, in your own neighborhood that can possibly um, be subject to this. And you certainly don't think would be receptive to it either. So I just like to respectfully request that y'all take all these matters into consideration. And, um, and in my mindset, uh, I, I didn't hear Mr. Rollins say how many people actually signed the petition, how many people opposed it, how many people were notified. If it was eight or nine that were notified, five or six that signed the petition, I don't recall hearing the number that actually um, signed the petition. Do we know how many people are actually notified and how many actually responded? Opposed? Yeah, Under general statute, the requirement for that notice is to all the surrounding property owners. Right. And to qualify as a valid protest petition, 5% of the owners of the land 
that constitute a 100-foot buffer around the property have to sign on to that petition in order for it to be qualified as valid. And as far as for the purposes of the board, uh, the valid protest petition kicks them into having to do a three-fourths vote. So whether it was five or 50, it, it's, as far as the board is concerned, it's a valid protest petition. And I agree with that. I think the most relevant thing that the board needed to consider, not that you can't consider how many came at the vote of the protest. I think the, the legally relevant aspect of that is, was it enough of the buffer area to trigger a protest petition? And uh, I don't know that I would have advised Eric to pass along to you necessarily that number as just sort of un, unduly prejudicial. You know, you need to know that it's a protest petition and that that triggers a 75% supermajority requirement. Okay, the, there's a protest petition that one, two, three, there's five signatures. I'm assuming they all have standing, they're all within the... Yes. Right. Yes. Again, are these all also the, the, the letter, the sign of those folks, uh, do they have equal standing or are they just interested parties? Or? Mr. Mayor, both of those would qualify as valid protest petitions. Uh, the other one was submitted for record. So it looks like 10 or 11 signatures. So, <coughs> Mr. Mayor, if I could speak again. Yeah, sure, Derek. My point, just what I was trying to make here, and then I'll, I'll sit and wrap it up, was to me, uh, if you notified the individuals and you had a response that, it, to me, it does matter. Uh, majority rules, when you have an election, the top vote getter in the race wins the office. So at some point in time, numbers do matter. Majority does matter. And I think that, um, you, know, you should take that into consideration. If there's 10 residential uh, property owners who have been notified, 8 out of 10, 7 out of 10, 70 or 80 percent are have a concern about this, then you know, you know, I think you need to be aware of that and take that into consideration. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Anyone else? There? Oh, come up, sir. John White, uh, then uh, uh, Sheila Clay, she owns uh, 230 Pauling Avenue. Oh, no, you you don't live at 230 Pauling Avenue. No, my mother-in-law was that. Be brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she got the letter, but she didn't know what we talked about, so she sent it to me. Derek and I played phone tag last Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but I didn't have time to get a written uh, denial to the, to the town hall. Uh, and I agree, all the, the eloquent words that John has spoken uh, with the traffic and with, with the eyesore, and, and I'll hit you call again. I mean, you got a beautiful river walk. We used to build one in Columbia, Tennessee, where I live, and it's nothing compared to y'all. And we use it daily, but you have to go past all that to get there. And some of our visitors are like, that's a little weird, and this is. But now I see you want to put the same thing where your brand new beautiful bridge from Walmart will pass over, and you might see the same thing again. So I really don't understand how you want to turn I mean, it's a fairly attractive land into another potential eyesore and, and the traffic again uh, that they're talking about on a one lane or lane and a half road. What's your last name, sir? White. And John John. White, correct. As you're not living there, not the, the attorney for your mother-in-law, I'll, 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 I'll put down a note on you. Well, All right, thanks. <laughs> Any more takers? Down the floor now, is it? What's your name, please? I'm Margaret Cook. I live at 346 Pauline Avenue. And I just want to uh, read to you my thoughts so it can take that on. When we bought our home in 84, um, Pauline Avenue was on for buying them. And that, at that time, was no trailers. Now the zoning has been changed to R2 allowing trailers. If zoning can be changed on a wheel like that, what's it worth? I mean, you 
go if you buy a home for that reason. And then it's changed back and forth. For, you can't, you know. So uh, I just would ask you to uh, think about the people, the rest of the street, which would be like 98% of the street concerning just the people. Think about their part in this, what it does to them, what it does to their property. And uh, just downgrades everything. And uh, I have to ask you, would you like to pray your part to join your property? It downgrades your home that you have from the start thought that it wouldn't be changed and done. like to say it this time there's been no applicant I just heard the word trailer park being thrown around and right. there hasn't been a, a uh, land development permit submitted for such an application also in your residential two classification in in our UDO the dimensional requirements for these lots minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet minimum setbacks from the front lot line or 25 feet from the side lot line or 10 feet from the rear lot line or 15 feet minimum open space 40 percent of the lot is required to be open space in this district and under permitted uses b2 all permitted uses listed in r1 residential zoning district classification subject to special requirements if noted manufactured homes individual limited to one home per lot. Thank you. 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 Agenda item, board decision, board, not necessarily a decision, but we're not bound to make a decision tonight unless the board wants to, but board's consideration of the rezoning petition that we just heard the public talk about. So I'm opening it up to the board for the comments. Yeah, you don't know. No. 
six percent of people don't vote in elections. Most don't, don't, don't care. They just don't get around. Well, they just don't do. Yeah. They don't want to get involved. In it. Yeah. Just to see a lot of people signed up. What says the board? Plenty of time to hash it out or call for the vote.
But if you're going to consider adopting the amendment, you would be obligated to have a public hearing first. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It will still be in the board's discretion when it comes back to you in a month. I make a motion to go to the planning board. My understanding is what I've heard, all the residents around the area pretty much are in favor of it. Let's see what we're going to get too much. Let me ask you something. Could somebody oh, say we got a motion on the whole second. We got a motion on the full. Well, I don't know what I'm voting for. Well, I told you we got a motion, we got a second, then we had a discussion. So there's a motion to refer to this matter, this application to the zoning board. Is there a second? Uh, All right, now there's a further discussion, Bob. Yeah. Somebody can explain to me just what you're changing the text for. The application here states to add the classification of a hospice care facility to the list of permitted uses. This class is completely different than adult daycare homes or assisted living facilities. And they listed up here uh, three particular sections that they would like to see amended. However, um, I would assume that chapter 152, section 21, where uh, they're including it in, into the special use district would be the, uh, the classification, the, the avenue they would take, um, simply because that if the board were to vote favorably for a text amendment to include this type of facility in an R1 special use district, what you would be gaining there is it would not blanket the whole district into allowing these uses to be located everywhere. It would be, of course, a uh, permitted use listed in a special use district, which is site-specific, um, which would apply on a case-by-case -case basis as deemed appropriate by the board for the special use proceeding. And again, a text amendment is not the stage of the game to, just like with that map amendment we just looked at, it's not, it's not dependent on what any one property owner would do with that designation. We need to consider and, and the consideration that would go to the planning board and then come back to this board is whether or not this amendment fits with the UDO and the way that we're going to discuss the plan when we come back. Can we discuss the plan or we discuss this? Yeah, you can discuss it yes. Yes. now. Yeah, discuss it now. Or we can discuss it when it comes back to the planning board, if it goes to the planning board. Is there any kind of downside to not changing the text? Well, I know. I mean, I mean, these things we've got to take into consideration. Circumstances change. Everything in this town is fluid right now. We don't know where we're going to be 10 years from now. And that's something that I think the board needs to discuss. I, I don't think it's my position as administration to, to uh, state the, the positives. But I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is if we're only changing the text, would it amount to any kind of negative thing with the people that live there? Well, I mean, it depends on what you want to do. So this is what I'm trying to find out. Well, well, it, but it will not change. The if I understand your question, uh -huh. right, if a text amendment to the UDO is not going to render it a change mm -hmm. in the use. It would render a change in the use of any property that already had that, that zoning designation. Got change. Okay. But if, if all that happens is a given if the text amendment comes along that, says, that proposes a, a special use be added to a given mm -hmm. special use zone, yeah. it, it will not change the use of any piece right. of property in the whole town. Because all it, would, all it would result in is anybody who could who wanted that special use mm -hmm. uh, designation, they would have to come back and go through the whole special use process. So that's what I was trying to find out. Right. It's not like it's a bottom use at all. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is that, okay. It's my understanding we're talking. Is this a, um, hospice collaborative with both hospices, or is this just one of the hospices? You know, we have two hospices in town. And I would like to see, <coughs> with this before we change anything, that where this is right now, that three fourths of that money was raised before we started changing. I'm not sure it's going to happen. What, what, 
permissible and proper for the board to ask them, why are you doing it? What are you going to do there? Mm -hmm. Show us your plans. And that's, a, that's. Is this wrong? Is this misdesignated then on our agenda? I don't think things I don't mean to, but I thought this was just a change. I did too. Change. I didn't realize it, it is really because easy. because drive-through uses are not permitted at all in neighborhood. But is this a special use application or just a text? It's, no, it's, it's, it's a text. text. It's a text to to add to add drive-through. So it's a special use. So text it, then it wouldn't be uh, particular to this lot. Correct. It, it would be have to go back and apply. It, it, it would be particular. To yeah, it would be particular to a lot of its own special use. It would. But we're not talking special use. Either. Right. If we include this text amendment, is to include drive-throughs not in the neighborhood mixed use district, but in the neighborhood mixed use special use district. Which did, yeah. it, it, put, it puts them at the beginning of a special use process if their intent is to get their property. If there's going to be a suggestion of a drive-through on that property, I've got a feeling how the board feels. <laughs> I mean, if they do, we might want to go ahead and. I say, I Wait, Billy, have you been wrong in the motion? I was wrong. Have you been wrong? You said that. Yes, you said that. Right. Right. I, I said, whatever. I said, I was <laughs> so, all right, we're back to ground zero. I don't know. All right. that 
we, we are limited to 10 years uh, unless we're going to go through the disposal process uh, and actually advertise it. Um, so it is it's written for a 10 year lease at $10 a year. Um, and essentially, that's, that's it's just a pretty straightforward. There is the authority to review it. We would have authority to review it at the end of that. Period. It would just be a similar process to this, unless you change the law. Any action be taken? Uh, if the board is comfortable with the lease, uh, I was in touch with uh, Don Capport today, who said that they're. I can't imagine why their legal their legal department would have any question about it. It's essentially, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a gimme. But uh, it is, I guess, subject to technical changes. Uh, I still think, and I think it would be most expedient for, for them and for the town to go ahead and adopt this resolution and approve the lease subject to s small technical amendments that you would give me the authority to make if necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard to sign the lease with the uh, lease with even with some technical amendments. Endorse uh, uh, motion to the Discussion. All in favor, raise your hand. That passes. All right, let's get to the done range. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, the situation with the Glenwood in question came up at the last meeting. Uh, I think Eric really answered that question pretty thoroughly at the time. There are two, there are basically two questions with the general general notion of a gun range in, in the town. The first is, would it be permissible under zoning? Um, and our zoning, our UDO does not define gun range. It's not intentionally dealt with. It can fit pretty neatly under the definition of Eric, what's the, what's the definition we're working with? Uh, indoor recreation. Recreation facility indoor. Yeah. Eric had asked around and found other municipalities had similarly treated gun so The fact that it does meet the zoning code does not, and that, this, that current piece of property already, you know, is zoned to have indoor recreation facilities, so we wouldn't need to have any rezoning done to it. But there is the problem of uh, Ordinance Chapter 130.04 that makes it unlawful to discharge a firearm in the town of Franklin unless you're a sworn officer of the law. Um, it would be that the town would have to change that ordinance in some way. I mean, I think the, the least uh, drastic thing to do, obviously, is to say unless it's a fully licensed and properly you know, permitted gun facility and then only, you may say then only indoor if it's not official. I, I kind of feel like it's in, kind of feel like it would be wise to take your time and consider whether you, the reasons that, that maybe a no discharge within the town ordinance was passed to begin with, whether or not, whether or not you really want to make exception. Um, but as far as, as gun ranges go, oh, there's another thing, the uh, the webinar that we tried to get and we got sort of waitlisted for touched briefly on the fact that it has been upheld many times over the years uh, to for local governments to, to ban discharge of firearm within their limits. So that's I'm comfortable with the, the ordinance that you have is is proper. Um, but the question then it just falls to that. 130.04 and whether you want to change it. Uh, would, would not the ordinances that ban the discharge of guns be because of public safety? That would be the noise or straight bullet. Yeah, I would imagine. And, and I don't think you're going to have a straight bullet okay. escaping. Okay. It's scary. Fear. Okay. That's what I heard years ago. Oh, I've been scared to horses on things. I heard that they might be shaking hands. How long is that? I heard that they were acting like you shake hands. 
Uh, so somebody uh, don't have a gun in the Yeah? Well, it's been in the city since the 76th Well, it may have been adopted. Well, there's three things that I've, that I've heard. Noise, stray bullet, carrying livestock or something. And if, if it's inside, and if it is bulletproof, which I ain't sure you can count that, not bulletproof, soundproof, that bulletproof. Yeah. None of those three would be. Another one have livestock in there, so we're going to have to work that. Another one have livestock in there, so we're going to have to work that. To pull that out, I'm not going to be clear of this. Well, what would our options be tonight? Well, I don't have a, a proposed amended ordinance for you, so if you would like to see one to consider, then it would just be sort of the direction to me to, to bring you one in the next meeting, and that would give you a basis for discussion. Unless it was put in a due authorized license facility, some some description of what type of general range would have to be within, wouldn't that be the text of it? I mean, wouldn't that be... Well, I'll make sure that the people were sitting there. Oh, yeah. Well, if it's out, well, then, you know, you can't make that sound. You can't make that sound. That's a different situation. I've been to the indoor ranges, and I'm telling you what, they're built like four knots. There's no going to escape those things at all. Is there, Bob, is there an actual requirements on the, uh, the level of fitness of all stuff just by the nature of building one. Ashray does it, and uh, who does? It's, uh, Ashray, it's a uh, American Society of uh, Engineers. Okay. okay. It is. Uh, yeah, there's. It's all designed by state and federal government statutes for sound and air quality. So uh, all that stuff will have to be met. So who would do? Who would be responsible for? <laughs> Inspecting during the building process. Say the, say the and would you have to apply for a permit? Yes. Not just on the town. Just uh, well, one town, one from the county, and uh, the county would follow the state guidelines. County. Close the county. The building. The building. And then the, and then the building department would bootstrap the requirements. For the indoor range, you know, from from state. State. Is that right, Tom? <coughs> no different. No, no different than fire engine requirements. Okay. As long as you've got documentation that this assembly gives you that uh, sound attenuation or that correspondingly that fire rating, that building department semantically can't say no as long as it complies with that contested, documented assembly. Let me ask you something. Uh, how long uh, are you proposing the range to be, and how many stations will we have? There'll be twelve lanes. And they'll be 75 meters so that uh, law enforcement can qualify. I was getting ready to ask the chief or, or Steve, uh, can, can y'all do your qualification on a range like this? Um, yeah. 75 meters is a lot of law better qualification. The distance is good. So there would be an advantage. <laughs> to Depends on the different stages, how it's laid out. Oh, okay. Different yardages, requirements. Concealed carry is three, five, and seven yards. That's what it would be. John, how burdensome is it on your end, or is this something we should put on the, the applicant to try to come with to do the background on this? Um, I wouldn't think it'd be terribly burdensome. Then there'd be a motion then that you give you some authority to go ahead and uh, start working up some language maybe to be used. I, I think that would want to make that motion? I'll make a motion. Since he got a second, any further discussion? I think we need to. Bob, what kind of time frame do we need? Well, it's just, uh, you know, when we get done, we're maybe looking at summer or early fall, how we get it built. Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay.
specific statutory authorization for town to allow uh, solicitors in, in the streets subject to a permitting scheme um, that you're authorized them through that to require the date and time when the solicitation is to occur, the location at which the solicitation is to occur, and the number of solicitors involved, and also to require proof of a $2 million liability policy that, that solicitors would have. Um, and to, to require them to identify the tenant. Require an address or something, some kind of safety? I think you could probably require that. Um, short of that, you're, the other option that you have to deal with the problem of solicitors in the street is just to ban them outright. Uh, they, you have to be careful in this area because you implicate free, free speech. That's, that's where the challenges are with this kind of thing. Uh, they're often with for newspapers. Uh, and I would also point out to you that, that well, a couple of things. In the list that I read to you, you notice one of the things that you can't require is some explanation of who they are and why they're there. You, co you can't ask that. That's sort of like you know a permit, app, um, a parade application. Well, same thing we talked about on this uh, the public hearing. Yeah, you're, you're you're constrained about what what all you can ask because you'll get into viewpoint discrimination in a hurry if you, if you have that. Any. So, John, can you ask if they're non-profit or for profit? Or is that not allowed? Either? I would be mighty careful with it. I I haven't I haven't read anywhere that. To, is any guidance on that particular question? But I just wouldn't ask if they've got the if they've got the twenty five dollars. That's the maximum fee you can charge for that permit, uh, and proof of the insurance. I, and you can fill out the rest of the application. I wouldn't ask them anything else. Can we limit the locations within the city? That down there at Hardy's is too dangerous from an intersection, and I know uh, they do it down here at the Amish Deli and on Main Street, American Legion. And that's pretty pretty safety through there because the speed limits is, is down to it. I think so. What the statute says is a local government shall have the authority to grant authorization for a person to stand in on or near a street or state road. Now, to me, that means if you have authorization to, to limit it to a street, then you can say yeah. all of these streets except here, here, here. What about that? Can we limit it to days of the week? Probably. Probably. I think that's a time, time place and is a little more open than the time, place, and manner kind of restriction. Is it allowed even do they all, do they have a permit when they're doing this? Is oh, this going through the town? Is it yeah, you have to get a permit. No, no, no. Why not? Well, that's what I'm saying. So you got your back here? Or to my knowledge, no one's required to get a permit yet because BFW and other places are already doing that year round. And these people, I've went there and talked to them several times. I think it's the church out of Kentucky, is that right, Steve? They're wearing traffic vests. And if you limit them, you have to limit the VFW and other places. Yeah. Right. As of right now, we don't have a permit that you fill out. And I think Warren and I discussed that in meeting recently, and Derek about coming up with one down the line, requiring $25 or whatever. Right. And this, this that statute that I was just reading to you from is an adoption of an ordinance in, in that form by this board is, is the way you get to a permit through the police department. They couldn't just come up with it on their own. So. Well, I don't believe uh, allowing them to continue, especially under the ice conditions when it's pouring rain and you know slip pavement, do the work. Out there in course they did have the best on, but uh, I, I personally think that we they ought to be, be permitted and, and the town town ought to not be held liable for them. They need the insurance. That much of it I think we ought to go ahead and just for the middle. Just, just for kids, do we know right now is whether the uh, the other handlers have the insurance? To my knowledge, they don't. That would probably stra stra uh, strap somebody like the AFW. They could oh, yeah. come up with a policy and insur insurance policy. They've got they got my policy. What about John Proctor? 
Yeah. 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 High school fundraisers yeah. fall under that too, like car washes yeah. for like the different groups at the high school and things like the boys and I personally would not be nearly as troubled if it was on Saturday. Myself. If we get anything more than just limited to Saturday. Yeah. Boy, you give me the high eyebrow there. <laughs> uh, once you start living, I'm afraid once you start living in one location, also they're going to go to another one that actually turned out to be worse. <laughs> you know, when you start trying to get worse. That you can't do it at this location. This location and not give them the option of doing it. And I do believe that you can, if that's, if that's what you want your ordinance to be, I think you can do that. Like, it's, like I say, it says at A Street in A Street. So if it's at this street and not any others, then that'll be. That would, that would limit us here? to allow car washes for the cheerleaders and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. That would limit us on that because we want them out in the middle of the street where we are. All right. They would not be in the roadway, but they, this would not limit okay. anybody on the sidewalks. From, okay. From the, That's not all right. I think right now we've had a good discussion. We've talked about it. I don't think it's on our uh, item, on our agenda to take a turn and go to a negative or anything. I think we started the discussion. And if you brought back on uh, when somebody feels the need to know that, that am I misreading this? Well, I think we ought to, we need to go ahead with something. And I think we can make a motion and John go ahead and draw something up for us to look at. I'm not sure what direction I want to go. Well, if you were making a motion, what would you direct the John to put up you know, my name or what? I would direct John to go ahead and put some, put some words in there for something to start working with anyhow for us to look at. Well, we'll have to go we'll have to suggest to him whether we're going to restrict the number of people that are going to be there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, we'll have to we'll have to suggest to him whether we're going to restrict the location, the days of the week, the hours of the day, to the insurance. Joe, I think we're going to have Start something yeah. and, and then let him come up with something and then we can right, adjust. Then we can adjust. Then we can adjust. There's, there's already ordinances in other cities that are already taking this because Derek's been looking into them. So we can go ahead and take something and put it together. And if that's too restrictive, say in a location or whatever, a day of the week. But it has to be fair. Well, what will John use as his guidance? I mean, I sense there's some on the board that wants to just leave it the way it is. How will he know which road to go down? That's what we're paying for. <laughs> no, no. But you know, they, uh, to leave it the way it is, then they don't have any insurance or anything else down there. Are we going to? If we're going to provide insurance, we need, we're going to make a motion that we, we have to bring John to work on an ordinance to allow it to set up a permitting system for solicitation on the streets. Wouldn't that be better for Rex to Derek and I? He's looking at me and kind of giving me the evil eye. No, no. <laughs> what Derek and John? John likes to do the actual chapter ordinance. Uh, Derek, Derek's uh, doing the research. So we have to be doing this. Is the board of the will, is the board collectively of the will that we need to in some way get a better grasp on it than what we have now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. And John's understanding that we have serious questions about locations, maybe about times, and then the question about insurance. Because if we require insurance, we will have effectively. And on, on that note, I yeah. should point out that I don't think the, the insurance question is, is optional either. I mean, the, the, the statutory authorization says the applicant shall also furnish to the local government advance proof of liability insurance in the amount of at least $2 million to cover damages that may arise from the So are we right now doing the wrong thing by letting them not be insured? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to dig a little gap right out there of, of, of what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. So Nobody knows. I know. Of course, that's the forbidden question. Yeah, yeah. you can't do that. That's now. Permit system is going to tell us that, but it is going to tell us that you know, there is some control over it. They've got, they've got a permit, and that, can, and that can be enforced if they're out doing it. If we don't have a permit, then we have an enforcement action. So, Farrell, then your motion is for John, with the assistance of Derek, is necessary to maybe formulate a, a reasonable uh, system, a permitting system? Yes. Thank you. 